There are some questions that all of us get asked in life. What's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? I frequently get asked that last question. Where are you from? And occasionally, the very persistent will ask me that other question. No, where are you originally from? All of us have been asked one or more of these questions at least once in our life. So where am I originally from? I'll get back to that in the end. A few years after I was born in the United States, my parents decided to move overseas. I vividly remember going with my dad to visit his friends in the Middle East. Without exception, the first thing they did was serve Arabic coffee. But I didn't like coffee and I didn't want to drink it. So at the time, my dad told me that refusing coffee was disrespectful because it's an important aspect of the Arabian culture. He told me to just close my eyes and drink it like I would medicine, but with a smile. I didn't understand it then, but he was teaching me to adapt to the culture I was in. By the time I was 15, I'd lived on three different continents in North America, Europe, and Asia, and interacted with many completely different cultures. I returned to the United States for high school. Then I got my undergraduate, MBA, and law degrees. I spent the next 10 years after graduation successfully practicing IP and patent law in the United States. Then my life changed. I mean, really, really changed. My wife and I decided to move to the Middle East in 2004. In my mind, how difficult could it be to start a new life in a new place? I had a multicultural upbringing and I was multilingual. I've lived in and traveled to over 60 countries by plane, car, boat, and even by way of long distance cycling trips. Turns out that it was very difficult. When we first moved, bewildered Westerners would ask me to explain things that they found peculiar. I had a pretty standard answer for them. You don't really need to understand why people do certain things differently. Just adapt to it, never adopt it, and move on. As Anais Neen wrote, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. I was seeing things through my own lens. At the time, my logic was that we would all eventually return to where we came from and would have difficulty readjusting if we adopt, so we should only temporarily adapt. I then began to realize that something was missing. I expected to have a greater sense of fulfillment and satisfaction as a result of my cultural experiences. But I didn't, so I began to wonder why. It turns out I'd been wrong. Before I tell you why, let me take a moment to reflect on these two terms, adapt and adopt. The two words look almost identical, a mere one letter difference between them, but there's an ocean of difference in their meaning. According to Webster's, adapt means to adjust oneself to a new situation or circumstance. And adopt means to take on or accept an idea or attitude. When you adapt something, it's a temporary change that is time and location dependent. Basically, when in Rome, location dependent, do as the Romans do, time dependent. To adopt something, on the other hand, is a permanent change that is time and location independent. An idea or attitude becomes an inseparable part of who we are, our identity. Basically, even when you leave Rome, you still do what the Romans do. Two very similar words with two very different outcomes. Although initially my advice was to adapt always and adopt never, I changed. Why did I change? It all began and ended with those cups of coffee. Ever since I moved to the Middle East, and whenever I visit friends or colleagues, I would always be greeted with that same cup of Arabic coffee. So decades after the coffee incident with my dad, I began to reflect on his words from a completely new perspective. Not a different one, but rather a deeper and richer one. When we are interacting with cultures and peoples who are not our own, do we only adapt to them or do we also consider adopting from them? It was then that I started looking beyond the coffee and paying attention to the intricate details of this tradition and the meanings it entails. Kahwa, the origin of the word coffee, is more than just a drink or a caffeine dose in the Arabian culture. It's actually very much ingrained in the culture and treated with the utmost reverence. Similar to tea in Japan or China, or a handshake in the West, you would never reject any of those in fear of offending your host. I came to learn that there's an etiquette to serving and drinking coffee. A uniquely designed pot called the dalla is used for pouring the hot cardamom infused kahwa into a very small cup, finjan. The host remains standing next to the guest, pouring small quantities of coffee into the finjan. The guest once done, usually after one or two cups, would so slightly shake the empty finjan with his right hand to indicate that he doesn't want any more. This coffee process is full of symbolic undertones that reflect traits found in the Arabian culture, hospitality, respect, and kindness. 
There's a saying that it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I've learned that we should all be open-minded to connecting with new cultures while maintaining the right attitude and principles. Now more than ever, this is especially important as we tackle increases in racial, religious, and cultural intolerances. But how do we decide? How do we decide whether we adapt to something or adopt something? For me, it came down to the three I's. The first is integrity, the second is intellect, and the third is intuition. Let's start with integrity. This is our moral compass, our North Star. The underlying premise for all of our decisions to differentiate between right and wrong. For some, it's a higher authority, God and religious tenets. For others, it may be man-made laws. When followed, we believe that we and the world we reside in are better because of them. I remember a wonderful story. While on a family vacation to the Amalfi Coast in Italy, we went to a restaurant famous for its tiramisu. We were sad to learn that the tiramisu contained alcohol, which we don't drink. Without hesitation, the generous owner told us that everything is possible in southern Italy, and he insisted on making a whole dish of non-alcoholic tiramisu so we could have just one piece. We went the next evening, and his favorite dessert lived up to its hype. The best tiramisu we ever had and worthy of every bite. Neither of us compromised our integrity, and the owner adapted to give us an experience to remember. Only if a trait passes the first eye, integrity, do I then apply the second and third eyes, intellect and intuition. In their most basic form, intellect is, what do I think about something? And intuition is, how does it make me feel? Is it something I want to adopt permanently or only adapt to in a certain place or situation? During a long distance cycling trip with my friends in South Korea, I learned that speaking on public transportation was taboo as it infringed on others' personal space and comfort. I thought this was great and chose to adopt it into my own life. The adopt and adapt concept can also be applied to the simplest of things. I lived in the Netherlands for a few years in the late 1970s, and I learned that the Dutch love their fries with mayonnaise. I gave it a try, and I never had ketchup with my fries again. On the other hand, there are times when you just need to adapt to the situation you're in. For example, in certain regions where people are habitually late, even to business meetings. I adapted to the cultural differences by factoring in a small buffer for, for late starts. So in a nutshell, integrity answers the question, can I? And intellect and intuition answer the question, will I? So why does this matter? Why does it matter if we adapt to things or adopt them? Because intercultural experiences facilitate human connections, which are the key to human happiness. Let me say that again. Human connections are the key to human happiness, which is something we all want in life. We all want to be happy. The longest study on human happiness known to mankind was and continues to be conducted by Harvard University. Since 1938, they've followed individuals throughout their lives to determine the answer to one question. What makes us happy? They found that it wasn't fame, fortune, or beauty. It's our relationships, connecting to people, to our family, friends, and others. This was the number one predictor of happiness. The most popular class ever taught at Yale University is a class on how to achieve happiness. The professor of this class, Dr. Lori Santos, also has a podcast, The Happiness Lab, in which she interviewed the wife of Donald Wetzel who invented the ATM in 1968, over 50 years ago. If you can believe it, his wife has never used an ATM. Why? Because she still enjoys going to the bank, speaking to people in line, talking to the teller, connecting with others. So there it is, decades of international experiences filtered down to three key elements, the three I's, integrity, intellect, and intuition, to guide me when deciding whether I adapt or whether I adopt, all to be happier as a result of my cultural connections. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that the mind, once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original dimensions. Or in the words of Albus Dumbledore and Harry Potter, it is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are. So stretch your mind, make choices, relax, and enjoy that cup of coffee. And all that it symbolizes, wherever your adventures may take you. Now back to that question, where am I originally from? My answer is, in the world of frequent cultural interactions, it really doesn't matter. What matters is who we are. What characteristics have we adopted? What characteristics have we adapted? How have we improved ourselves on our relationships? Have we achieved happiness? That is what really matters. 
Thank you.